I want to talk about the main thing that John the Baptist said Jesus would come to do. Above everything else, John the Baptist said, He will baptize you in Holy Spirit. And surprisingly again, there has been almost a conspiracy of silence in the church about what John said would be Jesus' main ministry to us. And I want to share this burden with you that the church needs to get back both to preaching the millennium and to preaching baptism in the Holy Spirit. John was Jesus' cousin. And John began his ministry nine, no, three months before he was born. Did you know that? Because his ministry was to point to Jesus, the Messiah. And when Mary came into the room where Elizabeth was, who was six months pregnant with John, John leaped in her womb for joy. That has quite a bearing on the question of abortion. A fetus can be serving the Lord. That's six months. Anyway, he was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. That's an astonishing thing to get your mind around. But for the next 30 years, he spent his years alone out in the desert, feeding on locusts and wild honey, and dressing in the same clothes as Elijah the prophet. That's very significant. And then he came into his public ministry and began to baptize people in the Jordan River. And if you've been there, it's the lowest river on the earth's surface, and it's one of the dirtiest. And he was plunging them into that dirty river to get them cleaned up for the king. Not physically clean, of course, but spiritually. Because he was saying, the king is about to come, the kingdom's coming, and don't you think you're ready for it? You're just dirty people, and you've got to get it cleaned up for the king. And the way he cleaned them up was by dunking them in the river, and God himself used the water to wash them clean on the inside. But he insisted on two things before he did that for anyone. He insisted first that they confess their sins. And that in the Bible means naming them. We were talking last night, some of us, about the general confession in Church of England services where you say, Lord, we have left undone those things we ought to have done and done those things we ought not to have done. And people say that and never think of a single thing. And frankly, that's useless. The only confession that works is confession of sins, plural, meaning listing them, saying, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. Lord, I'm sorry I didn't do that. That's confession in the Bible. And John insisted that people confess their sins before he was baptized. And therefore the Pharisees were not baptized because they wouldn't confess it. We're told that. The other thing he insisted on is that they bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Or to put it simply, as Paul put it, to prove their repentance by their deeds. And when they said, what kind of thing are you expecting? He said, well, if you've got too many clothes, give some away. That's repentance. If you've uh, been fiddling your finance, get your books straight. That's repentance. And then he said something that I've never heard a preacher today preach on. He said, and be content with your wages. That is proof of repentance. Have you ever heard a preacher say that today? If I ever got the chance to preach at the Labour Party conference, that's what I'd preach on. <laughs> the Conservatives need it too. Be content with your wages. Whatever they are, be content. Contentment is a proof of repentance. Covetousness, of course, is a sin. And you can't be covetous and content at the same time. So there was John the Baptist, plunging people into the Jordan River to get their past sins forgiven. And he believed that that baptism in the river was a sacrament in the sense that he believed the physical act had a spiritual result. And God forgave their sins and cleansed them. But he was very much aware of the fact that that's all he could do for them. He could get their past cleaned up but he couldn't keep them clean. He could get their sins forgiven, but he couldn't stop them doing it again. So he said, you need more than I can do for you. 
I can baptize you in the Jordan River in water and that will deal with your past. But your future is going to be just as dirty unless you have another baptism, unless you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he at that stage, like every Jew, did not believe that the Holy Spirit was a person. He saw the Holy Spirit as the invisible power of God, not as a full person. Therefore, he did not say he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He said he will baptize you in Holy Spirit. And putting it that way, of course, the emphasis falls on the adjective. He will baptize you in Holy Spirit. That's what you need. Now, we need to ask, what did John understand by this and what did his hearers, who were Jews, understand by that phrase? But before we look at that, let's just look at, did John say anything else about Jesus? He said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Did he say anything else? He said one other thing. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These were the only two things he said about Jesus. But now comes the interesting thing. How many times did he say those two things? We are told. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, only once and privately to two people. He never said it publicly. Only once and privately to two disciples. But the other thing, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, it says, he said it to everybody who came. To everybody he baptized in water, he said, Now I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. In other words, which was the main thrust of his preaching? Not, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That's what he said publicly to everybody. And therefore, in preparing the way for Jesus, he was virtually saying, That's the most important thing he's coming to do. The thing you most need. Now the surprising thing is that the church has picked up everything John the Baptist said and did except that one thing. The church has continued baptizing in water. The church has continued preaching forgiveness of sins. The church has picked up his words, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If you take communion in the Church of England, you say that every time you take communion. But the church has not picked up on he will baptize you in Holy Spirit. You rarely hear that preached. And through the 2,000 years of church history, the church has hardly ever repeated John the Baptist preaching, repeated everything else. And the result is that the church has been doing for everybody what John the Baptist could do, getting their sins forgiven, getting them baptized in water. That's where it stops. And it's not enough. And John the Baptist knew it wasn't enough. That's why he said, you need somebody else to come and help you. Now, the 20th century has seen a change. Quite literally, from the first day of the 20th century, it's been a big change. And the first day of the 20th century was January the 1st, 1901. Right? And on that very day, in a Bible school in Kansas, a place called Topeka, near Kansas City in America, in a Bible school, the president of the college gave lectures on the book of Acts. And the students said, why do we not experience what they experienced in the book of Acts? And frankly, that's the reaction most people have when they study Acts. Why is our church not like that? I think that's the inevitable reaction you have. And they said, we're going to spend all night in prayer asking Jesus to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. And they did. And before dawn, all those students experienced Pentecost for themselves. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in new languages which they'd never learned before. From there it spread to another place and then to Los Angeles, to a black church, or a church led by a black pastor with one eye, in a street called Azusa Street. And from there it spread to Norway and Sweden. And in Norway there was a Methodist missionary from England called Barrett. And he crossed the North Sea to Sunderland 
and preached in the Anglican Parish Church in Sunderland where a Reverend Body was the vicar and it went on from there until all over the world people were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit by Jesus and speaking in new languages and for the rest of the 20th century Pentecost became part of Christian language again alas in the first half of the century, churches didn't like it. It was noisy. Churches liked to be quiet and reverent. And so they didn't like it. Furthermore, they didn't like it because it brought a lot of lower class people into church. It seemed to spread like wildfire among ordinary people. And the church had become very upper middle class by that time. And they didn't like that either. The result was that for the first 50 years of the century, most people who experienced Pentecost, or rather who, whom Jesus baptized in the Holy Spirit, were turned out of the church, were asked to leave. I'm reminded of uh, a lady from Trinidad, who came, sorry, Jamaica, who came to London years ago and she went to the nearest parish church on Sunday because she always went to church in Jamaica. And she behaved as she did in Jamaica. So she joined in everything. And when the vicar got up to preach, she shouted, Preach it, brother! Preach it, brother! Amen! Hallelujah! And the verger of the church came over to her and said, Would you please be quiet, madam? You are disturbing the service for everybody else. And she said, But I've got religion. And he said, well, you didn't get it here, madam. <laughs> and tragically, the result of that is that thousands of West Indians stopped going to church when they came to England. And then, fortunately, some West Indian evangelists realized what was going on and said, there's only one thing for it. We've got to start black churches in England. And the black churches are now the fastest growing churches in England because white churches couldn't cope. Well, now that's what happened in the first half of the 20th century to anybody who had, quote, a Pentecostal experience. And so it meant that new denominations sprang up, Elam, Assemblies of God, also Church of God, all sorts of new Pentecostal denominations sprang up, simply to provide fellowship for people who had been discouraged in their own churches. But in the 1960s, things began to change radically because in the 1960s, suddenly, these things started happening in the mainline churches. In 1967, it happened to thousands of Roman Catholics. It was happening to Anglicans now, to Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians. There was a friend of mine who was an Englishman, uh, a Methodist minister, who went to America and became an Episcopalian, and he was in a very fashionable, huge Episcopalian church in America, and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and the church threw him out and the bishop sent him to a downtown dead church in Seattle and he went and Seattle became world famous and Dennis Bennett wrote a book called Nine O'Clock in the Morning you've heard of it well that was my friend the English Methodist minister who was kicked out of the Episcopalian church over there and so the mainline churches said, hey, we better be careful this time what we do. And they were a bit more careful and a bit more welcoming, but still quite cautious and suspicious. And so you had renewal movements. At first, the people within the mainline denominations who were getting Pentecostal were called Neo-Pentecostals. That means new Pentecostals. But now they were inside the church, not outside. But then that changed, they began to be called Charismatics. And then there's been a further change, and sadly I have to tell you that in the last ten years, it's all gone quiet again. And people are not preaching baptism in the Spirit anymore. And uh, though it became part of 20th century church life, there is now almost a conspiracy of silence about this. Later this afternoon, I'll tell you why that's happened. But I was so burdened about this that at the annual conference for National Charismatic Leaders, which 
uh, covers about 150 nationally known people whose names you would all know. Um, two years ago I got up and said, how many of you are still preaching baptism in the Holy Spirit? And there was a dead silence. And I said, why? Why have we dropped it? It's Bible, it's what John the Baptist said Jesus would come to do. And we've rediscovered it. And now we've lost it again. And that's why I wrote this book. Jesus baptizes us in one Holy Spirit. And praise God, it came out on September the 1st, but it's already had to be reprinted, so at least people are reading it. And I'm trying to call them back to the, one of the major things that Jesus came to do, to baptize people in Holy Spirit. Well, now that's the burden that I want to share with you. And uh, I want to now ask, what did John the Baptist understand by that phrase? And what did his Jewish hearers understand by it? You see, it's a phrase that nowhere occurs in the Old Testament. You can read every page of the Old Testament. You'll never read about anybody being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, would they understand anything? Well, they would. They'd understand quite a lot. First, they would understand the word spirit. Because everywhere in the Old Testament you find spirit. Um, I'm following very roughly the outline of my book, so if I give you the chapter headings, you'll be able to follow. I've been talking about Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist, how he said Jesus would be the Lamb of God and the baptizer in the Spirit. But whereas the church has picked up the first, they haven't picked up the second. The strange thing is that Jesus' followers, the ancient followers through the centuries of church history, hardly mentioned it. But in the 20th century, it has been mentioned frequently until the last few years. And now it's disappearing again. So there's a kind of surprising silence about this in the pulpits of our churches. So now let's look into the prophetic promise of the Old Testament. And we look first at the spirit in the kingdom of Israel. Don't try and copy all this down, by the way, while I'm, while I'm talking, because you'll miss what I'm saying. But copy it down as I get to it. That's the best way. And then you're linking what you're hearing with what you're writing. Okay? So, in the kingdom of Israel, the spirit was certainly active. He wasn't called the spirit, much less the Holy Spirit. He was simply called the spirit of God, or your spirit, or his spirit. And the word used is very interesting. There are two words for breathing in the Hebrew. There is one word for normal breathing, which is called nefesh. Nefesh. Now listen carefully and you'll hear my nefesh. Did you hear it? Because nefesh means silent breathing. The sort we're doing most of the time. You see? It means just normal breathing. But they have a much stronger word Ruach, Ruach, R-U-A-C-H, and you pronounce the C-H as in Scottish, Loch, Ruach. And you can hear me breathe when I say it, can you? Ruach, you hear me breathe? That means for heavy breathing, for breathing you can hear. It, it means for moving air, for wind. The same word used for breath, wind and spirit, and it means moving air. And of course, that means other things. It not only means moving air, it means mighty air. Because my normal breathing can't affect much at all, but that can. And a gale or tornado can. So moving air, that you can hear, is powerful stuff. You may not know where it's come from, and you may not know where it's going, but you know when it hits you. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. That's wind such as destroyed 15 million trees in the southeast of England a few years ago. That's ruach. That's what we call an onomatopoeic word that sounds like its meaning, like the word splash. I can't say splash without this paper getting wet. And ruach is like splash. Its meaning is what it sounds like. Ruach. And this ruach of God had these three aspects to it. One, it was moving, God moving. Second, it was God moving powerfully, mighty. And third, it was God's mouth speaking. Because every word you hear from me, I have to breathe out to say it. 
I can't talk while I'm breathing in. Very difficult to talk while you're breathing in. So I have to keep breathing in and then I talk while I breathe out. And so breathing out carries words. Moving air, breathing out carries words. That's why Paul said an interesting thing in his letter to Timothy. He said, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's a pity that it's been translated, all scripture is inspired by God. The word he uses is expired. Actually, all scripture is breathed out by God, meaning spoken by God. Because breathing out carries words. So we have three dimensions of God's ruach. That it is God moving, and God moving powerfully, and particularly God speaking. And therefore we find that throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God enables ordinary people to do extraordinary things because it's the mighty, invisible power of God. The three things that people can do, which they could never otherwise have done, are to do the impossible, to be the unattainable, and to say the inconceivable. These are the three aspects of the Spirit's work in the Old Testament. To do, to be, and to say things that otherwise would be quite beyond you. So let's think of to do the impossible. Uh, the first person I think of actually is Bezalel and his colleague Aholiab. Do you know what they did? Well, they were tradesmen and they had a skill. They could make bricks. They were brick makers. They'd learned it in Egypt. And now God told them to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. But he said no bricks. He said it's to be made of wood, and silver, and gold, and embroidery, and animal skin. But we're just brick mayors, Lord. My spirit will come upon you, and you'll be skilled woodworkers, and silversmiths, and goldsmiths. And it says those two men had every skill that was needed even though they'd only learned how to make bricks. You find that exciting? There's a gardener in uh, Guildford, you know him, Harold, and he used to take pictures of fungi and uh, slides and show them to people. The beauty of fungi is amazing, but he did it with a simple camera that you just had to point and press a button, you know the simple cameras. His son bought him a very complicated camera costing hundreds of pounds so he could really take better pictures. Because he was getting famous, he was on the BBC and he was showing these pictures all over, but they were rather poor. So his son bought him this very expensive camera and he looked at it, he saw all the f-stops and all the apertures and all the buttons and everything else and he just could not do anything with it. Now he knew the Holy Spirit. He'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he said, Holy Spirit, teach me how to use this camera. And instantly he knew exactly how to use it. And you should see his photographs. Without even reading the book, (laughs) the Holy Spirit taught him how to use the camera. Very practical, isn't it? Holy Spirit can give you an ability that you never had before. That you've never been taught to do the impossible. Well, Samson's another example. You know, all the Sunday school take-home papers I ever saw showed Samson as a kind of Rambo, Sylvester Stallone kind of, you know? And he, big bulging biceps. If Samson had looked like that, do you think Delana would ever have said to him, what's the secret of your strength? I'm encouraged that Samson looked just about like me. And yet he could carry city gates for 20 miles. And he could kill 300 Philistines with the jawbone of an ass as his only weapon. How did he do that? It says the spirit came on him. And he had supernatural strength. That was his downfall, of course, because he didn't realize when the spirit left him. And then you could tie him up with string. Now, all the way through the Old Testament, people do the impossible thing when the spirit comes upon them. Secondly, The Spirit comes on people to enable them to be what they could never be. And in particular, to equip them to be leaders of God's people. Have you ever said, I could never be a leader? 
then you are qualified to be a leader. Because then you'll have to get the spirit to help you to be a leader. It's people who think they, they can lead who are the dangerous ones. It's the people who can't lead whom God wants to choose as leaders. Then he gets the glory. Now you see, Israel needed leaders. They needed princes. They needed kings. How did they get them? By getting people anointed. And the spirit come upon them. That's what happened to Saul. If only Saul had stayed within his anointing of the spirit, but he didn't. He went to a spirit as medium. He got, he got possessed by an evil spirit at the end. He got destroyed. But he started with the spirit coming upon him. But there came a day when the spirit left him. And Samuel went to a young shepherd boy called David. And the spirit came onto David at that day. And David was now the anointed leader. Now you see, one of the key things a leader needs more than anything else is wisdom. Because there are two extremes of leadership. One is dictatorship and the other is democracy. A leader has to lead, but not in, as a dictator. And he must not let the people tell him what to do. That's democracy. And to get a balance between dictatorship and democracy is the toughest job for any leader, and particularly a leader of God's people. And boy, you need wisdom. And Solomon is the classic case. In a dream the night before his coronation, God said, Solomon, I'll give you anything you ask. Fame, wealth, anything. Power, you just name it. Now, if God said that to you, what would you say? If God said, it's you. I'm just seeing who watches the National Lottery. <laughs> But if God said, I'll give you anything you want, it's you, what would you ask? And Solomon didn't ask for wealth or fame or power. He said, I need wisdom more than anything else. How can I handle all these people unless you give me wisdom? And God said, I'll give you that. And because you asked for that, I'll give you all the rest. I'll give you power and wealth and fame. And the next day, Solomon faced an impossible situation. Two prostitutes, unmarried mothers, both with babies, and one of them had had a cot death. And their baby was dead. Only one baby now. And both women say, that's my baby. And here's Solomon faced with two women arguing over a baby. Now that's a situation from which any man would run a thousand miles. He's going to offend at least one and probably both. And Solomon the night before had asked for wisdom. And now he got it. He said, it's very simple. Cut it in half and you can have half each. Which was a very wise word. Because the real mother said she can have it. She couldn't bear to see her baby killed. Whereas the, not the mother, she said, oh yes, cut it in half. Because then they both lost a baby. And Solomon said, give it to that woman. It's her baby. Wisdom. Now you see, that's a wisdom that comes from above. I'm going to give you another example of it in my own experience. Too show you how real this is. I was preaching in Islington and after the service or meeting a lovely young couple came up to me and said, David, if you can't help us, we're getting divorced. I said, what? I said, how long have you been married? Three months. And we've made the most terrible mistake. We are terribly unhappy. We should never have got married. We've made a dreadful mistake. We're going to get divorced unless you can help us. I said, well, I've got to go for the train in a few minutes. I thought, you could spend hours with this couple. I said, how did you meet? And then it came out. She had volunteered to be a prison visitor. And very foolishly, they'd sent her to a men's prison. How foolish. You know, I go to men's prisons now where women are the officers in men's prisons. It's utterly humiliating and degrading, the whole situation. By the way, I regularly go to the Verne prison in Dorset on Portlandville, which has the first Christian wing in any prison in Britain. An entire wing is converted. And I go and teach them. It's a sheer joy. They're the most teachable people I, I teach. It's very exciting. But anyway, she went into this men's prison. And you know, when men counsel women and women counsel men, you're just inviting the devil in. You really are. You're very foolish. 
And so she led this boy to the Lord and he was soundly converted, no question about it. And she discipled him and he grew and he became a very good Christian. After some years, of course, he was released. And he told this girl, he said, I've nowhere to go. I have no family, no relatives, no friends. And she said, well, I haven't either. I'm living alone. She was nearly 30, wondering if she'd be on the shelf. And he said, you know, I've got to say something. He said, I've got very fond of you. In fact, he said, I've fallen in love with you. And she said, well, to be honest, I've fallen in love with you. And he said, what do you say to get married? He said, neither of us has family. Surely the Lord meant us for each other. And so as soon as he got out of prison, they got married immediately and they went into her apartment to live. And then they discovered that they'd never seen each other outside the prison. And they were totally incompatible. When he undressed at night, he just jumped out of his clothes and dropped them in a heap on the floor. And when he dressed in the morning, he just got out of bed, put his two feet in the trousers and pulled them up. Very efficient. And when he, when he ate, he ate with his fingers, never used knife and fork. Now she'd been brought up in a nice home with lace curtains at the windows, and everything tidily away in the drawers, each with knife and fork nicely placed. And after even weeks, they hated the sight of each other, couldn't stand living in the same place. And they come to me and they say, if you don't help us, we're getting divorced. After three months, they said we should never got married. You made the same mistake other Christians I know have made that provided you're both Christians, you're right for each other. That doesn't follow at all. But anyway, I said, Lord, please give me a word of wisdom. And he did. And I said to them both, now listen very carefully, this is what you're to do, week on, week off. The first week, you both do everything his way. And you, or his girl, you've got to throw your clothes on the floor and learn to eat with your fingers. But the next week, you are both to do everything her way. And you are to put your clothes away in the drawer and learn to eat with the knife and fork and you do week on week off like And the girl said, that's so weird, it's got to be of the Lord. And uh, they said, is there anything else? I said, no, that's the lot. And off they went. And I've never seen them again. But I've had a letter from them. About nine months later, dear Mr. Porson, we never thought marriage could be so wonderful. We are so happy. And pages of it, pouring out their joy. I was so thrilled. They didn't bother to tell me whether they were still doing it. They were just too happy. So now you see, I can write a book for marriage. It's called Week On, Week Off. I found the answer. But I have never told anyone else to do that because it was a word of wisdom that the Spirit gave for that couple in that situation. So I've never tried it on anybody else. That's important because so often when something like that happens, oh, I can write a book on it now. Found the answer. <laughs> but it could be just the wrong advice for somebody else unwise advice for anybody else. Well, to be a leader, you need wisdom above everything. And people are not naturally wise, we are naturally silly. I don't know why they talk about common sense, but it isn't all that common. Well, to be the unattainable. And to say the inconceivable, the main function of the Spirit, the power of God, the invisible moving power of God in the Old Testament, was to enable people to prophesy. Every prophet, it says, the Spirit came on them and they prophesied. In fact, Saul, the first king, became a prophet. The Lord promised, when you meet that bunch of prophets, the Spirit will come upon you and you'll be changed into another man and you'll prophesy. That's what they did. That's what he did. And you'll find Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them. Zechariah probably puts it best. He says, the Spirit of the Lord came on me to declare Israel's sin to her. You see, it takes a lot of courage and boldness to tell people their sin to their face. And yet that kind of boldness is a mark of the Spirit. 
And that's what enabled the prophets to tell Israel, you're sinning against God. You're wrong. See, anybody can be a popular preacher and tell people what they want to hear. But to tell people what they don't want to hear, that's a different matter. And that requires the Spirit. And so the Spirit is behind all the prophesying of the Old Testament. To say what they could never have thought of saying. And to say it with courage and boldness. Well, those are the three things. You find it says the Spirit came on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were all prophets. Moses, Eldad, and Medad, even a donkey can prophesy. Balaam's ass. Deborah, Miriam, because women prophesied as well. Samuel, Saul, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And above all, the Spirit was behind the music of the of Israel. Now this is very important. Every choir master that David chose for the temple was a prophetic person, a seer, which means somebody who sees prophetic visions. It's terribly important, I tell you, the music in a church can either be a great help or a great hindrance. Church choir can either really help the kingdom forward or hold it back. It depends whether the spirit is on them. And woe betide you if you've got a choir of people who are not spirit-filled people. They will soon become a music-worshipping group and at odds with the rest of the church. A friend of mine had such a choir in a church in the north of England. He prayed with them, he talked to them, he prayed about them. He tried every way he knew, but they enjoyed music. And that was it. And one Saturday night he got desperate. He said, Lord, tell me what I can do about the choir. And he wished he'd never asked because the Lord told him what to do. And on the Saturday night he went into the church with an axe and he chopped the choir pews to firewood. And when the choir came in on the Sunday morning, the beautiful choir pews were in splintered wood on the floor. It took him all Saturday evening to chop them up. And God began to move in that church from that side. <laughs> well, you never know what God will tell you to do. But thank God he never repeats himself. Because he told Isaiah to run through the streets of Jerusalem and start naked. He said, that'll teach them. And as you run through the city, start naked, shout, God is going to strip all of you of everything you have. It's a powerful sermon. Any volunteers to do it in Margate? Well, fortunately, God rarely tells two people to do the same thing. So he's not telling you to be a streaker here. But if he did, would you do it? These prophets were pretty bold people. Told Ezekiel to go and bury his underpants and dig them up a year later and show people what they were like. Boy. Life was not boring in those days, was it? Now that's the kingdom of Israel and the spirit enable people to do, say, be and say things that otherwise were totally beyond them. So when John the Baptist said to the Jewish people, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, they at least knew that. They also knew that God was holy because God had said to them repeatedly, be you holy because I am holy, says the Lord. And all the prophets talked about being holy people. They understood. Therefore, when John said he will baptize you in Holy Spirit. They understood what that meant too. The only word they didn't, they weren't familiar with was this word baptize. But actually they now were familiar with it because John was doing it. And the word baptize unfortunately has never been translated into English. In your Bible it is only transliterated. Which means the Greek word is put in English letters. It's not translated. The word in Greek is baptizein. And so it's just spelt in English. If it were translated, it would shock too many people. And the General Secretary of the British Foreign Bible Society told me that they're not allowed to translate it into English. They can do it into any other language, but not English. Because the word means to be immersed. To be plunged. To be dipped. And John was called John the Plunger. John the Dipper or John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist. But if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll find that Jesus was given the same title in John's Gospel. I'm very happy to say Jesus was and is a Baptist. 
a baptizer, a plunger, a dipper, an immerser, a soaker. That's what the word means. And that's why the Greek Orthodox Church, when it baptizes babies, plunges them right under water three times in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. And of course they have to do it at the, the end of the service because the baby's yelling so much after that they can't do another thing. But it was on a televised service recently from the Greek Orthodox Church in London. They could never sprinkle a baby because it's a contradiction in terms to baptize by sprinkling. Because in Greek that means to immerse by sprinkling. It just doesn't make sense. But unfortunately the word is never translated in English Bibles because it would upset too many people. But that's what it means. I picked up a Greek newspaper and it announced that a ship had been baptized. The Laconia. Now what do you think had happened? A bottle of champagne over its bows and God bless all who sail in it? No such thing. The Laconia had gone down in the Bay of Biscay. It had been baptized. That was the headline in the Greek newspaper, ship baptized. That's what it means. And John was doing that in the Jordan River. He was plunging people underwater. It means to put a solid in a liquid. It was used of dyeing wool in a bowl of dye. Or of dipping a cup into a bowl of wine to fill it. It's to put a solid in a liquid. And so, when they saw John baptizing water, they would understand what he meant when he said he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He will plunge you in the Holy Spirit. He will soak you in the Holy Spirit. He'll put you right in to Holy Spirit. And that's what you need. Your baptism in water only deals with your past. But that will ensure that your future is kept clean, that you're holy. I mention this because the prime function of baptism in the Spirit in John's mind was purity not power, but purity. And the interesting thing is that all four Gospels mention that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that hardly anything else is to be found in all four Gospels? Of course, the death and resurrection of Christ is in all four because that's the heart of the Gospel. Apart from that, there's hardly anything else that you can find in all four Gospels. You won't find the Lord's Supper in all four Gospels. You won't find the Lord's birth or conception in all four Gospels. You won't find his baptism in all four Gospels. You won't find his temptations in all four Gospels. You won't find him washing feet in all four Gospels. You won't find any of his teaching in all four Gospels. Not a single word. You won't find all his miracles except one. There's only one miracle in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. None of the rest. So in fact, there's hardly anything to be found in all four Gospels apart from his death and resurrection, except for he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Why should every Gospel writer include that? You won't even find repentance in all four Gospels. Some of you are looking a bit doubtful. Check me out on everything I say. People are always surprised. They say, I couldn't believe what you said and I've checked it out. And so, well, check me out. I don't want you to believe a thing I say unless you can find it in your Bible. All right? But I'm telling you the truth. Now, why should they put this in all four Gospels unless it is so important that you cannot write a Gospel without including it? Now, even John the Baptist did not know that it was Jesus who would do this. What God had said to him, by the way, it was God himself who thought of the phrase, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he gave it to John. And he said, you're baptizing people in water, but there's somebody coming on baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you will know who it is when you see the Holy Spirit come on someone. And John didn't know. He says, I was baptizing in water so that I might know the one who would come and baptize in the Holy Spirit. And one day he saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove on his cousin Jesus. And he just had a big argument with him. Jesus came and said, baptize me in water. And John said, no fear, you don't need it. I've heard about you. This is for getting people cleaned up and you live a clean life already. You don't need to be baptized. He said, you should be baptizing me. And in fact, I love to tell people, that, especially Baptists, that John the Baptist was never baptized. 
there's a thought, isn't it? And he said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, now, John, it's right to do what's right. So baptize me. Which leaves anybody else without a shred of excuse for not being baptized, right? Because if there's one person who could be excused from obeying the Lord in that regard, it's Jesus. Well, now Jesus, John knew that Jesus' cousin was the one who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. But he didn't do it for three years. Nobody got baptized in the Spirit. Jesus went on baptizing in water, actually. Or rather, his disciples did. They continued that part. But no. In all of the four Gospels, whenever baptism in the Holy Spirit is mentioned, it's always mentioned as something future. Something yet to happen. And there is no description in the Gospels of what happens when it happens, of what it, it's about. And so we're not going to be able to build up a picture of baptism in the Spirit from the Gospels. It's just a, a promise. He will do this. But what it is, we don't know. Funnily enough, when we turn to the epistles, every reference to baptize in the Holy Spirit is past tense, as something that's already happened to people. And again, it's not described. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, we were all baptized in one spirit. But he doesn't say what it is. He only says, you already know what it is. Because the epistles were written to Christians who had all been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so nobody needed to tell them what it was. So in fact, when we look at the fulfillment of the promise in the New Testament, we don't get a lot of help from the Gospels because they are all written before anybody got baptized in the Spirit. They just simply look forward to the day when it would happen. And we get no help from the Epistles either because they all look back on it happening and say it's already happened to you. So again, there's no description. There is only one book in the Bible from which we can get a picture of what being baptized in the Spirit actually is. Because Acts is the only book written on location, as it were. Describing it when it happened. Are you with me so far? And that is why the book of Acts is absolutely fundamental to any understanding. And that is why those who don't want to know about being baptized in the Spirit dismiss the book of Acts as mere history and of no relevance to us. And that is a very common habit to say you can't build any doctrine on the book of Acts. And I could name nationally known preachers of the word today who would say that and do say. So. But of course, if you cut out Acts, you have no idea what it's about. Because the Gospels look forward to it, the Epistles look back on it, but neither describe it. But the book of Acts does. And so when we look at the book of Acts, we see that, oh, I've missed out a very important thing. In the Old Testament, they already experienced these three things, but there were two other things they looked forward to that the, apostles, that the prophets promised would happen, that the kingdom of God would come on earth as it is in heaven, and that this would mean two things. First, a king anointed with the Spirit, a good king full of the Holy Spirit, a spirit-anointed sovereign. And of course the first essential to having a good kingdom is to have a good king. And that was promised. Read Isaiah 11. It says, The king when he come, the spirit would be upon him. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of fear of God. He would have everything that the spirit can give. That's the kind of king we need. Somebody who's got all the gifts of the spirit, all the fruit of the spirit. That was one half. But you can have the best king and you can still have a bad kingdom if you have bad subjects. You see, you need both a good king and good subjects, a good sovereign and good subjects. And the other half of the promise that would come was not only that a king would come who would have the spirit without measure, who would be filled with the Holy Spirit up to here, and who would have everything that the spirit could give him, but the spirit would be poured out on all flesh regardless of sex, age, or class. Old men and young men, men servants and maid servants, all classes, both sexes, all ages. 
would have the Spirit poured out on them too. So you'd have a kingdom packed with people full of the Holy Spirit. A king full of the Holy Spirit, subjects full of the Holy Spirit. Exciting, isn't it? Well, now the fulfillment of that began to come in the New Testament. The kingdom came because the king had come. And the Spirit was now going to come. And Jesus himself was the fulfillment of the Spirit anointed sovereign. And it says the Spirit was given him without measure. He had the lot. All the gifts of the Spirit, all the fruit of the Spirit in Jesus. Perfect king. But the kingdom couldn't come until there were Spirit-filled subjects. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. For the first time. And so we find in the book of Acts that first time when not just 120 but 3,000 others the Spirit came on them. And now we begin to understand what it is to be baptized in Holy Spirit. But of course, the big change that has happened is that on the last night before he died, Jesus talked a great deal about the coming Spirit. But this time, he did not say it. He said he. And for the first time, these Jewish people realized that the Spirit of God was actually a full person. He was the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, another person like Jesus, who would come alongside when Jesus had left. And that, of course, changed the picture enormously. For now, the Spirit is a person, not just a power, not just purity, but a person. And that, of course, had filled out their understanding. It made it necessary to believe in the Trinity of because they now knew God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, the book of Acts tells us at Pentecost they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were filled with Holy Spirit. And not only did they know it, but everybody else knew it. And one of the things that strikes you in the book of Acts is that when anybody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, they know it, and everybody else who is present also knows it. It is an event. As one Bible scholar has it, a man called William Barclay, whose commentaries are very popular, he says it was as definite as catching influenza. I rather like that. You know when you've got the flu, and everybody else knows it too. And he said that's how it was when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They knew it, and anybody else who was present knew it as well. I'll come back to that in a moment, say how did they know it. But at this point I want to point out that such a rich experience was this that they used a huge vocabulary to describe it. And when we study baptized in the Holy Spirit, we haven't just to study those words, because those actual words only occur seven times in the New Testament. Four times in the four Gospels, twice in the book of Acts, and once in the epistles. But that's not the limit. By the way, born again is only mentioned five times in the New Testament. Whereas baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can find the phrase seven times. Why then do we hear so much about born again and so little about baptized in the Spirit? Amazing, isn't it? But in fact, it's mentioned far more times than seven because there are synonyms, there are words used for the same experience, but a rich vocabulary of words. Here are some of the other words. Filled is the same as being baptized. Because in Acts 1, Jesus said, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And a few days later, they were all filled. So baptized equals filled, filled equals baptized. There are also phrases like the Spirit being poured out on them, the Spirit coming on them, the Spirit falling on them. There are phrases like being sealed with the Spirit, being anointed with the Spirit. And these are all verbs. There are also nouns that are used. The gift of the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit, the earnest of the Spirit. And so there's a huge vocabulary of words, both verbs and nouns, which are used to describe being baptized in the Spirit. And therefore we need to look up all the passages in which all these words are used if we're going to have a full picture of what they mean. Are you with me so far? So when we talk about baptizing the Spirit, we need to look up all these other words as well. 
And the most important synonym of all, and this is the most important thing I'm going to say now, this afternoon. One of the synonyms for being baptized in the Spirit is receiving the Spirit. Now that's very, very important. For the apostles, receiving the Spirit was the same as being baptized in the Spirit. And being baptized in the Spirit was the same thing as receiving the Spirit. So that right through the book of Acts, in fact only once is what happened called baptized in the Spirit, and the rest are all called receiving the Spirit. But it's the same thing, and the same thing happened. Now that is revolutionary if you let it sink in. Because frankly it means, listen carefully, the majority probably of people in our churches on Sunday have not yet received the Holy Spirit. And that I believe is the main reason why we are so ineffective. We are trying to do Jesus' work without having received the Spirit. And Jesus told the first disciples, don't you dare try to do it. Wait in Jerusalem until you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then you'll receive the power to do it. Wait! Don't go and do what I've told you without the Spirit. It would have been fatal to try and evangelize the world without the Spirit. But we are trying to do it when many of our members have not received the Spirit. And all we succeed in doing is building up a guilt complex, telling people they should be winning others for the Lord. They can't do it. And we blame them. We preach against them. Say, you ought to be doing this. And all we do is build up more guilt. And make it more difficult for them to do it. Well, we need to come and look and put these things together in what I call a doctrinal definition. Let's get a very clear picture of what receiving the Spirit is in the New Testament sense. What being baptized in the Spirit is in the New Testament sense. And I've summed up the New Testament teaching in four simple questions. Who, how, when, why. Can't be simpler than that. And I've given two answers to each question, which I believe convey the whole teaching of the New Testament on this subject. First of all, who? Well, the first question is, who is the baptizer? And the answer is, Jesus. I can't baptize you in the Spirit. I wish I could. I can baptize you in water, but I can't baptize you in the Spirit. There's only one person who can do that. It's part of Jesus' present ministry to baptize people in the Holy Spirit. The trouble is, when you forget about him baptizing in the Holy Spirit, you tend to think only of what Jesus did for us long ago, rather than what he does for us now. You say he died for you and he rose again and he ascended. Yeah, he did. But what's he doing today? The answer is he's baptizing people in the Holy Spirit all over the world, by the hundred, a thousand. That's his present ministry, not his only ministry. He's praying for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us when nobody else is praying for me after Jesus. What a comfort that is, because his prayers are effective. But uh, what else is he doing now? Well, he's baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. That's his present ministry. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said that he's ascended and sat at the right hand of God the Father. And the first thing he's done is ask the Father for the promised Spirit, and he has poured out this which you now see in me. And where anybody is baptized in the Holy Spirit, Jesus is continuing his ministry. He is the baptizer. And we should preach him. I believe in preaching Jesus the Baptist. That gets people at least thinking, what on earth is he talking about? But he is. John was, we call the Baptist, and he's given the same title as John. The only difference is he baptized in spirit, whereas John baptized in water. But they're both given the title in scripture, the Baptist, the plunger, the dipper. So I believe we should preach that. But when did you last hear a preacher say that Jesus is the baptizer? You've heard him. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's our friend. When did you last hear a preacher say he's the baptizer? Who are the baptized? 
The answer is unbelievers can't be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've got to be a believer. Jesus said the world cannot receive the Spirit. And it's no good asking Jesus to baptize someone in the Holy Spirit if they haven't repented of their sins and believed in the Savior. Because they're not eligible. But, and this is rather important, it isn't automatic even to believers. That's why it is important to ask believers what Paul asked the disciples at Ephesus. Did you receive Holy Spirit when you believed? Because you can believe without receiving. The trouble is we've got so confused today, and here's one of the basic reasons for confusing it, that we've got into the habit, which is quite unscriptural, of telling people to receive Jesus. You know what I mean? Open your heart and let him in. Commit your life to Jesus. Receive him as your Savior and Lord. The apostles never talked like that. The word receive was only applied to Jesus when he was here on earth, and you could open the door and let him in. And he came unto his own people, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave authority to become sons of God, who were born of God. But that's in the past tense, all of it. You can't receive Jesus now, because he's no longer here. He is at the right hand of God. And from the day that the heavens received him out of their sight, the word receive is never again applied to Jesus in the Bible. From the day of Pentecost onwards, you receive someone else who's taken his place on earth. You tell people to repent toward God, to believe on the Lord Jesus at his right hand, and to receive the person who's taken his place on earth, who received the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, when they said to Peter, what shall we do? He did not say, receive Jesus. He said, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That was as far as John the Baptist could go. And then he went further and said, and you shall receive Jesus as your Savior. No. You shall receive the gift of the Spirit. And one of the reasons I wrote the book, The Normal Christian Birth, was to get people out of this bad habit of telling people to receive Jesus and to say, get them into the full Trinitarian uh, evangelism of saying, repent toward God, believe in the Lord Jesus, and receive the Holy Spirit so important that a new convert should be introduced to all three persons of the Holy Trinity from the very beginning so that they have a conscious relationship with Father, Son and Holy Spirit and from then on they can pray to the Father through the Son in the Spirit and they enjoy full Christian experience well I could spend more time on that but I want to rush on so who is the baptizer Jesus who are the baptized repenting believers and normally repenting baptized believers. The normal pattern in the New Testament is for people to receive the Spirit after they've repented, after they've believed, and after they've been baptized. That's the normal pattern. And uh, the only exception was Cornelius, and there was an obvious reason for that exception. Peter would never have baptized him unless God had convinced him that he'd accepted Cornelius a Gentile by giving him the Spirit. But in every other case, a person is repenting of their sins toward God, believing in Jesus, being baptized in water, and is then prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the best time to pray for anyone to receive the Holy Spirit. They're clean, they're empty, they're ready to be filled, and they're usually wide open with no inhibitions, no fears at all. And it's a lovely time to pray for people to be filled with the Spirit. And I had a vicar wrote to me recently, and he said he just baptized a number of adults, and he said, uh, then he read my book. And he thought, I missed something out. And he got them all together. And he prayed for them. And they all were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the spot. The whole lot. And he, he wished he hadn't he'd done it much earlier, <laughs> immediately after their baptism. But he, it was only two weeks late. And he got them properly birthed. He got them properly stuck. That's the normal Christian birth. Which is why I wrote the book of that title. Which has been classified under gynecology for the British Library and goes into every public library in the medical section. Would you believe it? Anyway, I've had interesting letters from doctors. Now then, how? Uh, how are we doing for time? 20 minutes. 
rush on. How? This is the crucial thing. What actually happens when somebody's baptized in the Spirit? How do you know it's happened? How do they know? Because everybody in the Acts knew. Inside, they knew it happened. It was a real inward experience. But it was always accompanied with outward evidence that convinced everybody else present that it had happened. Now we've come to the heart of it. What was this inward experience? What was this outward evidence? Well, inwardly they were filled. Filled up with God. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Just full of God. Filled right up. So let's go straight on to the outward evidence. What showed others that they were full up? That they had been filled? Well, how do you know when your petrol tank on your car is filled? Well, you can keep sticking your head in to look at the gauge, but not quickly. Pardon? No, when you're filling it up with petrol, how do you know when it's full of petrol? Overflows. It's obvious, isn't it? And did you know that God has given us a hole in our body, which is an overflow? If you want to find it, put your finger on your nose and just go down about an inch and a half. You'll find out. Huh? And whatever the heart is full of, said Jesus, what can I do next? And whatever your heart is full of, always comes out of your mouth. That's the overflow of your heart. Jesus said that. Right, you just laughed. Why? It came out of your mouth, I heard it. Because you were full of fun. At that moment you were filled with fun. Where did it come out? You laughed. So did some of you others. When you're full of fear, where does it come out? You scream. When you're full of anger, where does it come out? Whatever your heart is full of will come out of your mouth. And Jesus said, if your heart's full of dirt, it'll come out of your mouth. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that when somebody's been filled with the Spirit, something will come out of their mouths. They are full to overflowing. There is nothing in the New Testament about falling on the floor or pogo jumping or any of the other antics that have become so common. The Bible does not mention any physical result or any emotional result. It doesn't say you're filled with feelings. It just says you're filled to overflowing through your mouth. And in every case in the book of Acts, when someone was filled with the Spirit, their mouth opened and something came out. Not always the same thing. Often it was a language they'd never learned. It was so in my case, I've given my testimony in that book, and uh, as far as I could tell it was Chinese. But I've known people speak a clear foreign language. I was speaking in the Colson Hall, Bristol, and I said, Jesus can baptize you in the Spirit. I can't. You'll have to ask him. And a housewife sitting in the front row down in that huge hall told me afterwards she just asked Jesus to fill her with his Spirit. And she opened her mouth and poured out the strangest language. And there was a Pakistani man sitting five seats along and he leapt out of his seat and he ran along to her. And he started jabbering away to her in Urdu. And she looked at him like this. She didn't know what he was talking about. He said, but you speak Urdu. You speak my language. And she had been praising the Lord in perfect Urdu. I've heard a working man speak perfect Hebrew to God. See, that's when you begin to be convinced that you can do things that otherwise you could never do. Because I've never learned Chinese. That's when you begin to realize that the Spirit extends your capabilities way beyond your natural ability. See, life gets exciting then. There's no limit then, <laughs> you see? You can't make excuses, well, I can't do that. Because if God calls you then to do something, you know the Spirit will give you the ability to do it. Well, so that's the overflow. It could be, I hate the word tongues, it sounds like babbling. It's not, it's a clear language. After all, God gave all the languages. The first time he gave the gift of tongues was at a place called Babel. 
But then it confused everybody because nobody understood it. At Pentecost he gave tongues again, languages, but this time it brought people together. But it was the same gift. And it's a beautiful gift. It's especially useful when you're driving. I can pray in tongues when I'm driving. And it's not dangerous if I pray in English. Half my mind is off the road. And that's dangerous. When I'm heading for a meeting, I can pray in the tongue. And my mind is not involved, just my spirit praying. So my mind can concentrate on the traffic. And I'm a much safer driver. I know some of you listen to my tapes while you're driving. You'd be safer praying in tongues. But there we are. But uh, it's a lovely gift. Especially when you've got stuck in prayer and you don't know what to say. Or you just don't know what to pray for. Lord, help me to pray for this person. Put words in my mouth. And there's a text in the Bible, open your mouth wide now for it. I find I can pray for an hour in a tongue. But in my own language I get a bit stuck. Well before that. See? But that's only one possibility. It could be prophecy. That's what it was in uh, Ephesus. It says some spoke in tongues and some prophesied. That's in your own language. But it's not what you would have said. It's words that the Lord is giving you. In other words, some form of spontaneous inspired speech is the usual overflow. And when you consider it, it makes a lot of sense that the first part of your body that God wants is your tongue. Because that little thing is set on fire by hell, says James. You've done more damage and committed more sins with your tongue. A vicar in church once said to his congregation, I'm going to show you that part of my body that causes me most temptation. There was a dead silence. People waited and he went, Yeah, we do. And James says, if you've never sinned with your tongue, you're perfect. It's a good ready-made measure to see how holy you are. If you never say the wrong thing, <laughs> where does that leave you? Jesus said, for every careless word, we will be hauled before the judgment seat. Boy, careless words. Well, could be prophecy. Or it could be, as in the case of Cornelius and his household, some spoke in tongues, and some poured out praise to God. I was sitting in a public park in Brasilia, the new capital of Brazil. And I was sitting with a dear English missionary, a very shy, quiet man. And around us were plenty of uh, families having a picnic. And we were talking about this and he said, you know, David, he said, I can't, I can't say I've got the Holy Spirit. He said, I've served the Lord faithfully as a missionary for years. I've done what I can in my own strength. He said, I've never seen a miracle happen. I've never done anything that I could say with supernatural power. He said, would you pray for me? He was such a nice man. So I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Lord, my dear brother has tried to serve you so faithfully for years and years, but he's never experienced your power. I said, please, fill him with your Holy Spirit. And he opened his mouth and he said, Hallelujah! And everybody in the park turned around. And I sort of slid away from him like this, you know. Sort of. <laughs> I'm not with him. <laughs> and then I turned back to him and his face was beetroot red. Oh, he was embarrassed. And he said, is that it? I said, that's good enough for me. I said, I just heard you overflow. I said, tell me, you've never done that before in your life. He said, never. I'm a good Englishman. He said, I would never do anything like that in public. And within 24 hours, he had healed two people in the name of Jesus. I don't care what comes out of your mouth. I want to know, have you been filled up to overflow? See? Because that's what it's all about. People are so full of God, they can't keep it. Can't put it more simply than that, can I? And now you see why I say that the majority of people in our churches have not received the Holy Spirit in the New Testament sense of that word. But what would happen if our churches did? I was in Stoke-on-Trent a fortnight ago. They are all praying for revival like that because Stoke-on-Trent is a depressed area. Dare I say it, little of the same sense that I get in Thanet. You know, 
an area that's suffering from unemployment, a bit of a dead end and so on. All the industry and stroke has gone, coal mines have gone, the pottery has gone. There's just a general air of, you know, what are we here for? And they're praying for a revival. But they had one 15 years ago, because I did my homework and found out their history. And 15 years ago, a vicar got baptized in the Spirit in St. John's Parish Church, Bezo. And he began to tell his people, hey, Jesus can baptize us in the Holy Spirit. And he went on until the whole church had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they talk of it today as the revival. But it wasn't, it was just the Bible <laughs> being put into practice. But it's all died away again now. But an Anglican curate got filled with the Holy Spirit in that church, in St. John's Church, Bethesda, Stoke-on-Trent. And his name was Michael Harper. Any of you heard that name? All started with this vicar in Stoke and just one church. And what I told them in Stoke was that can happen in any of your churches. You don't need to wait for revival quote. Jesus wants to baptize people in the Holy Spirit now. He doesn't just do it in revival, he does it any time somebody really asks him to. And who goes on asking until they get it. That's a very important part of it. Jesus said, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? Some people come to me and say, I asked for the Holy Spirit and nothing happened. I said, did you only ask once? Yes. Well, you can't really have wanted it. Because my kids, when they wanted something, they didn't stop asking. Can we have a bicycle? No, you can't afford one. Everybody at school has a bicycle. We still can't afford one. A few days later, we'd save bus fares if we had bicycles. And they just went on and on and on, and drips wear away stone, you know. And they got bicycles. And Jesus told a parable about a man at midnight who had unexpected visitors and needed food. And he knocked at his neighbor's door and said, I've got visitors, I need food. I'm in bed and the kids are in bed, I can't get up. But Jesus said that that man went on knocking. And finally, the man got out of bed and got some food. Then he said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking? And some people, especially older Christians who've managed for years without all this, they sometimes have to go on asking quite a long time, to get over fears and inhibitions. But I find that people who have just been baptized have no inhibitions at all. And that's the best time, just to pray, Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. So they know. So it's an experience without good evidence. When? Some people think it's a second blessing that comes later in the Christian life, don't you believe? It belongs to Christian initiation, it belongs to the very beginning. It was a Welsh evangelist called David Shepherd who once said to me, David, he said, have you noticed they were not filled with the Spirit in Acts 28, but in Acts 2? He didn't have much of an accent, but anyway. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, David? He said, they were filled at the beginning, not at the end. Well, that's what happened. Jesus says, this is for starters. That's why Paul said that we've all been baptized in one spirit into one body. It is your incorporation in the body of Christ. That's what makes you a member. Unfortunately, most churches are run like a club, not like a body. See, that finger is a member of my body. If you cut it off, you've dismembered the body. You've cut off one of my members, and I'm lost without it. A member of a body is totally different from a member of a club. But many churches are religious clubs, and membership in the church means no more than membership in the club. You get your name on the books, you pay your subscriptions, you attend the meetings, you vote at the annual business meeting, you support the leader, you do that in the football club or the women's institute. That's how many people got into church membership. They joined the religious club. And that's being a member on the roll 
R O L. But membership in the New Testament is not on a roll, but in a roll, R O L E. To be a member of the body is to function, is to do something for the rest of the body that nobody else could do. To have a unique contribution to make and to receive from the rest, so that if you are cut off, the body will suffer. That's membership of the body. And it is baptism in the spirit that makes you a member of the body of Christ. I'll tell you why. Because you will not know your gift until that happens. It is baptism in the spirit that releases the gifts of the spirit. And you need to know what your gift is so that you don't try and do what you're not gifted to do. I take an evangelistic crusade every year just to prove that I'm not an evangelist. It's not my gifting. It's freedom to discover what your gifting in the body is. And my gifting and calling is primarily to be a teacher in the body of Christ. And wherever I get an opportunity, I'll use that gift for the body. But I don't try to be what I'm not. That is my membership in the body. It's not where my name is on the books. It's how I function in relation to the rest of the body. Do you follow me? And it's baptism in the spirit that releases your function within the body. And that's why this statement of Paul's is in 1 Corinthians 12. Because the whole chapter is about gifts of the Spirit. It's about words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, interpretation, healing, miracles. That's what it's all about. In the middle of all that gifting, he says, we were all baptized in one Spirit into one body and made to drink of one Spirit. And then he goes straight back to the gifts again. Because where there is baptism in the Spirit, there are these supernatural gifts in the Spirit. Where baptism in the Spirit goes, gifts go. That's why they're going rapidly again now. Because we're getting away from baptism in the Spirit. Tragic. And now my time is gone, I'm going to just dare to show you one more thing on the board. And I can't spend time explaining it all, but it's in the book. And if you're really interested, you can... Oh, I'm sorry, the last why, very important. Some people say that baptism in the Spirit is for power for service. That's only half true. Baptism in the Spirit is for your salvation as well as service to others. It's for your purity as well as power for them. And we must hold this together. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that is, first of all, the proof of your justification. It is the prerequisite of your sanctification. And it is the promise of your glorification. Who says that baptism in the Spirit has nothing to do with salvation? Of course it has. It's part of the whole business of being saved. We need it for our salvation. We also need it for service for others. But here's what I want to show you finally. That's what I've just been saying. But now, over 2,000 years of church history, sadly, never in 2,000 years has the church clearly taught all eight aspects of baptism in the Spirit. Some have taught part of it now and others have then taught another part of it. But nobody's taught the whole thing. That is tragic to me. In the early days of the church, the sacramental view over took over and christening Chrismation, which is anointing a baby with oil, or confirmation, took the place of baptism in the Spirit. And people were put through these sacramental rites and told, you've been baptized in the Spirit, that when you were baptized in water, you were baptized in the Spirit. That's the sacramental view. It's the view of the Catholic Church, it's the view of the Orthodox Churches, and it's the view of other churches too. If you've been baptized in water, you have been baptized in the Spirit, even though nothing happened. That's the sacramental view. And so they were right on three things, a little doubtful about this fourth thing, but none of these things came in. The evangelical view, which came out of the Protestant Reformation, again said much the same thing, but this time it wasn't christening that was the substitute, but conversion became the substitute. If you've been converted, you've received the Spirit, you've been baptized in the Spirit. And that's widely taught in evangelical churches to this day. And so, they again, they'd got three things right, and one thing doubtful, there wasn't much emphasis on supernatural gifts. 
in either the sacramental or the evangelical. But then when the Puritans came, there was a bit of a change. And the Puritans in the 17th century in England began again to talk about baptism in the Spirit. But for them, they didn't mention spiritual gifts, and certainly not tongues. For them, it was primarily an inward assurance, a seal, an assurance. And one of the contemporary preachers of this view was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. That is his view on baptism in the Spirit, or was and became quite popular among Puritans and Reformed theologians. And again, there was an improvement here, because at least they talked about being baptized in the Spirit, and at least they said it was an experience. But they dropped that it was for initiation or incorporation into the body. So there was gain and there was loss. After the Puritans came the Methodist revival of the 18th century, with a tremendous stress on holiness. John Wesley said we've been raised up as Methodists to spread scriptural holiness through the land. And he had a most unusual teaching, very unusual, in which there were two crises in a Christian life. The first, when you were justified and forgiven, and second, years later, the second blessing, when you were made entirely holy, when you were made perfect, called entire sanctification. And he deliberately asked everybody, have you had both blessings? And that's when the phrase, the second blessing, came in. Now, John Wesley himself didn't talk about baptism in the Spirit, but he had a colleague called Fletcher, vicar of Maidley in Shropshire, whom John Wesley chose as his successor, who was the holiest man in England. Everybody knew Fletcher. Said he was the holiest man in England, and he was. He was actually a Frenchman, Flecher, or Flecher was his original name, and I preached in this pulpit on the shores of Lake Geneva. But he came to England, joined the Methodists, and became the holiest man in England. And John Wesley hoped that he would be his successor to lead Methodism, but he died before John Wesley. But he said the second blessing of entire sanctification is what the scripture means by baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he used the phrase. So again, he was recovering a bit more, but losing a bit more. It was from the holiness movement in America of the 19th century that the Pentecostals came. This is the kind of family tree. And the Pentecostals came with a very strong emphasis on Jesus the baptizer and the baptized as believers and an experience with the evidence of tongues. But these three they missed. It was the second blessing, it was subsequent to conversion, it wasn't the beginning of the Christian life, it wasn't initiation, and it wasn't being incorporated in the body. And therefore it wasn't anything to do with your salvation, it was purely power for service. When that came into the church in the middle of the 20th century, in the 1960s, to be precise, there were the Neo-Pentecostals within the church. Charismatic Catholics, Charismatic Anglicans, and they began to drop Jesus as the baptizer, but they kept these three things, and they kept power for service, but still they missed out these three, which the Pentecostals had missed. That gave way to the charismatic renewal. And charismatic comes from the Greek word charismata, which means spiritual gifts. And this was due to a man who died three weeks ago, a man called John Wimber, who came and uh, introduced many people to signs and wimbers, as we call them. And uh, he came with a hidden agenda, which many people were not aware of. He said, if we drop baptism in the Spirit and just have the gifts of the Spirit, then most churches will accept them. He realized that it was talking about baptism in the Spirit that was a stumbling block. So he said, let's have the gifts without the baptism. And Peter Wagner, his colleague, wrote a number of books. And another book had a typical title, How to be Pentecostal Without Speaking in Tongues. This was the kind of hidden agenda. Let's have the gifts without the baptism. And so he dropped Jesus as the baptizer. He top, dropped talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And therefore he began to be very shaky on an experience with evidence. But he recovered these two. But you can see, it was a backward step in a sense. And then, now in the contemporary situation, for the last five, seven years, 
most churches have stopped talking about baptism in the Spirit. And one result is that the gifts are dying out as well. And you don't often hear genuine prophecies in so-called charismatic worship today. You hear little pictures, but real prophecies from God I miss. And real gifts of God I miss. And often what is called singing in the Spirit is frankly drummed up by the drummer. And just lacks that genuine sense of being poured out on the people. Sorry, I'm not being cynical, I hope. But I miss the genuine article. Uh, I see a human substitute for it again and again. Something worked up around, something sent down. I'm not very keen on worked up worship. I love sent down worship. There's a big difference. And so in the contemporary scene, baptism in the Spirit has disappeared, and that's left a huge hole in people's experience because people need a direct personal encounter with God. And into that hole has come all kinds of other things, Toronto and all sorts of other things, and people looking for all kinds of experiences, when what they need is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, in the biblical way. And that's where I am at the moment. That's why the burden grew on me over the last three, four years, to get back to the biblical teaching and experience of Jesus baptizing us in Holy Spirit. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I wanted to at least share that burden with you this afternoon. I haven't been able to share much about it. There's a whole lot more in the book. But at least if I've got you interested. And may I finish the whole of today by saying this. If there is anything I have taught today which you cannot find in your Bible, then for God's sake forget it. I'm not here to persuade you to adopt my opinion. I'm here to tell you to get into the Word of God and check me out on everything I say. Don't either accept what I've said because I said it, and don't refuse what I've said because you didn't think that way already. At least be open-minded enough to go home and get your Bible and go through it, and do what the Bereans did in Acts 17. When they heard Paul teach, they went home and they searched the Scriptures. They didn't look them up, they searched them to see if what Paul said was there. And when they found it was, then they believed it and acted upon it. I want no one ever saying, David Pawson teaches this. I want them to say, someone taught me this and I checked him out in the Bible. And it's there. So I believe it. And I will share it. And I'll apply it. Well, thank you for listening. You've been very patient. Boy, time is always the enemy, isn't it? Is it still Saturday? Is this <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.